Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Nawal Asad. I'm uh, a consultant cardiologist and uh, cardiac e electrophysiologist working at the Heart Hospital in Doha, Qatar. It's uh, my great pleasure to uh, share this uh, session uh, today. Uh, we uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizer, uh, Pfizer, by hosting uh, uh, this uh, event. Uh, we have uh, two distinguished uh, uh, speakers. Uh, the theme for today's uh, uh, presentation is a NOAC experience, uh, patient uh, protection. Uh, this is basically the sixth wave of uh, Circulate uh, and uh, it's a very important uh, topic uh, today uh, uh, to be uh, presented to our uh, audience. So first uh, uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Hani Sabur who is a consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist and also a consultant in advanced heart failure and pulmonary hypertension at uh, Cleveland Clinic uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, Dr. Hani will uh, present the topic of NOAC in patient, um, in ACS uh, patient undergoing uh, PCI. Uh, Dr. Hani, the microphone is uh, yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nadal. It's a great pleasure to be in this meeting and also um, to, thanks to your kind introduction. So um, so this is actually a very important clinical topic. And uh, sorry, should you, let me just uh, turn on my slides. <laughs> Talk to you. Let's see. Uh, So this is actually a very important clinical topic since there's a tremendous overlap between uh, patients who have AFib and patients with coronary artery disease. And of course, when we have a patient with AFib who undergoes a percutaneous intervention or has an acute coronary syndrome, the management will differ radically than just having AFib or uh, non-valvular AFib. So um, this has actually been very well studied. And I think this is sort of the overall idea that came up after the randomized clinical studies, particularly Augustus and Intrust AF. So this is what we call the antithrombotic sweet spot. Obviously, if you we know from even the WOST study that triple therapy with dual antiplatelet and warfarin is a tremendous increase in bleeding without a very big change in the ischemic events. At the same time, we want to minimize the recurrent ischemic events and stent thrombosis. So it becomes really a critical thing to try and find what kind of patient, what are the patient characteristics, what is the duration, and what is the dose of antithrombotic agents that need to be done to minimize both complications on both sides. So the overlap of AFib and PCI, as I sort of mentioned, is, is great. You know, um, you have about 15 million people in North America and Europe who have AFib, of whom about 16 million will be indicated for oral anticoagulant therapy. About 5 million of those have coronary artery disease and one and a half million will have revascularization. So this is a tremendous overlap and remember, the child's VAS score includes patients who have coronary artery disease as one of the components of child's VAS as well as heart failure and what have you. So this is an overlapping patient population and it has overlapping indications for antithrombotic therapy. So with AFib, of course, we have to consider stroke risk, bleeding risk, renal function, specific subgroups, reversal agents, and monitoring. With vitamin K antagonists and platelets and NOACs. On the other side, on the conventional coronary artery disease part is that we have always had aspirin, and now I think the data is showing that we don't really want to do that. We have clopidogrel, we have prasugrel, and uh, we have ticagrelor. There are NOACs, and of course now if you look in the ACS component, you have dosing, you have stent type, you have duration of anticoagulation, bleeding, and also other uh, elements. So in fact, the center in the middle is where a lot of the guidelines have been trying to do until the recent studies, find a way to manage these consensus um, accurately. Now, the key point is, and this has been mentioned in all of the editorials, uh, 
you can't actually prevent all things at the same time. So, you know, with stent thrombosis and MI, we rely on dual antiplatelet therapy. With stroke, we rely on oral anticoagulants. But if you combine all three, you will have more major bleeding. How do you do that without reducing stent thrombosis? How do you do that without reducing stroke? So, again, it's a very complex um, clinical scenario. And <clears throat> now this is sort of an analysis that looks at possible combinations where you look at an ACS patient with AFib, this is the aspirin dose, aspirin duration, which P2Y12, so you have clopidogrel, ticlopidine, prosegrel, ticagrelor, uh, P2Y12 duration up to 12 months, oral anticoagulants, <clears throat> and there's uh, four uh, NOAX and warfarin, and then the INR high and low. And if you do the math, if you like math, I think this is very creative, um, you can actually have almost 1,683 possible combinations of early or late therapy and so on. It's very complicated for the regular clinician. So I think evidence needed to be brought up. Now, in um, in the earlier guidelines, <clears throat> the recommendations are all based on evidence-based medicine. So I think one of the important points is this. Randomized clinical studies studying specifically the strategy of dual versus triple of uh, warfarin versus DOAC combined with dual or triple N were very complicated and very rare until this moment. So the community and I think the clinical researchers and the companies came together and started to think about how do I actually solve this problem? So we started with the Pioneer AF study. We had the redual AC, uh, PCI study with the Bigatran, which was about 2,000 patients. Then we had the Augusta study, which was by far the largest and most robust of these, and it was a two-by-two two factorial assignment. So you basically had a box of four uh, possibilities. And finally, we have the Entrust AF-PCI with Edoxaban, which was published in 2019, right after the ACC publication of Augustus. Now, these are not efficacy studies. They're not powered to look for stent thrombosis or stroke reduction. However, it's one of the secondary endpoints. The main objective of these studies was to look for reduced or increased risk of bleeding. Which strategy had the lowest risk of bleeding of all of them? Now we'll go and de delve a little bit into the Augustus study. And this was a randomized study where you had one arm of apixaban, the other arm was warfarin. And in each arm, you either had aspirin or placebo, aspirin or placebo. And this is then the open label form. Everybody gets aspirin on the day of the ACS or PCI, and then aspirin versus placebo after after randomization. The outcome primarily is important bleeding, ISTH major bleeding or clinically relevant non-major bleeding, okay? Secondary outcome, which was not powered but becomes important later now, is um, death or hospitalization, death and ischemic events. And basically you had to have recent atrial fibrillation, ACS or PCI, and planned uh, utilization of a antiplatelet therapy for at least six months. So this is the summary of the major bleeding. So when you looked at aspirin versus placebo, there's a big difference. It's double the bleeding risk. So remember, aspirin is not a benign therapy, and you have to consider it very carefully. And if you looked at the primary endpoint of major bleeding and non-major bleeding together, if you took patients who underwent ACS and medical therapy, or ACS and PCI and elective PCI, and they broke them down into each group, the patients who had the highest risk of bleeding were patients who underwent ACS and PCI where the hazard ratio is almost double and elective PCI with the hazard ratio is 1.9. Medical therapy with ACS, i.e. no procedure, 1.49. So a 50% reduction, a double and a double with aspirin compared to the placebo. Now, if you took a Pixaban versus Warfarin, remember there's four arms here, you have four different permutations, right? Apixaban lowered the risk by almost 60% in the medical therapy arm, lowered the risk in the PCI arm by about 32%, lowered the risk, excuse me, in elective PCI by about 20%. Overall was 0.052. So yes, it doesn't meet statistical significance, but yes, it's also very reassuring. That is much better than warfarin in these patients. Now, what about the key secondary endpoint here? This is death and hospitalization, okay? Either death, which is obvious, or hospitalization, do anything related to 
cardiovascular event or AFib or heart failure. Again, a 3% absolute reduction, a 17% relative risk reduction, statistically significant. All right. So, um, so essentially, when you're looking at this, it's telling us that when you use the apixaban arm in the PCI patient versus the warfarin arm in the post-PCI patient, there's a 3% or more reduction of <clears throat> cardiovascular events, which are death and hospitalization, and it's statistically quite significant. So now the big question that came out of this study is, do we actually really need aspirin, right? So we've seen how that pixaban performs. We've seen how it's better than warfarin. Now, look, these are the four important groups, warfarin plus aspirin, warfarin plus placebo, with the highest event rates, Apixaban plus aspirin, 25%. Apixaban alone, 22%. So if you took this and compared it to the highest group and the lowest group, which is apixaban placebo, there's a 5% absolute risk reduction that starts at 30 days, and the number needed to treat is 18. So while this was not powered to look at individual outcomes, it's extremely reassuring to see that when you remove warfarin and aspirin, Apixaban performs very, very well long-term after the um, intervention. So this is a very a more um, detailed publication from circulation from the same group about the use of apixaban versus aspirin after the PCI or acute coronary syndrome. So when they looked at the hospitalizations, they are classified by all hospitalizations, cardiovascular-related hospitalization, which had to be an ACS or a stroke or AFib, other hospitalizations, and bleeding-related hospitalizations. So essentially, bleeding is what we are trying to drive down by this intervention. So if you looked at all of the possible outcomes where apixaban was involved compared to warfarin, significant reduction in hospitalization, significant reduction in cardiovascular hospitalization, and significant reduction in bleeding-related hospitalization. So the conclusion you can say in all possible realms, apixaban is actually better as a DOAC than warfarin. Here, we look at bleeding. And we look at bleeding-related hospitalization. Very importantly, the highest risk in the red, dark red bar is warfarin and aspirin. And the lowest is apixaban and placebo, right? So I think this is a very important concept that warfarin is really becoming um, a almost, should I say, dangerous drug in non-valvular AFib, and aspirin is becoming steadily unnecessary as we look at the therapy. Now, this is actually the breakdown by the actual events. I remember it's a big study at 4,000 patients, not powered for these outcomes, but they're important to look at nevertheless. So stroke was about 50% less in the apixaban arm, and hospitalization was significantly less. The other outcomes were not significantly different, or but they were still numerically at, at least less. Now, definite or probable stent thrombosis was less in the apixaban arm than warfarin. I think that's kind of an important point to consider. Now, if you looked at those patients, and it's a small number, small number of stent thrombosis during follow-up, the small number, it's 30 out of 3,468 patients, there's really not a significant difference in the background. So the CHAS-VAS, sorry, the CHAS-VAS score was high, has blood score was equally high, prior oral anticoagulant use, 40%, and the type of antiplatelet therapy was mostly Plavix, as you can imagine, and Tocagrelo, and they either had an ACS or elective PCI, right? So clearly, the, the background therapy, the background characteristics were not making a difference and were not increasing the risk of stent thrombosis. So they actually looked at this in a very systematic way from the Duke uh, Clinical Foundation group, and they actually presented this at AHA a couple of years ago. It's a very interesting point, because you look here at this is day zero, and then looking at days after randomization, right? So 30, 60, 90, 120, there's an initial peak, and then it flattens out. But look at the number, look at the percentage here of the whole group. The incidence of stem thrombosis at six months or starting from one day is less than 1% of this large group of 4,000 patients, okay? Now, if you looked at the stent thrombosis group, again, it's a very small number of patients. The percentage is very low, about 1%. Still, within that group, apixaban in blue is still better than warfarin. And if you looked at this in terms of timing, 80% of these patients who had initial stent thrombosis in the first 30 days, right, there was no likelihood of recurrence. Now, 
Was this driven by aspirin? Was it comparing to aspirin versus placebo? So again, the placebo arm had more stem thrombosis than the aspirin, but it wasn't statistically significant. It crosses the line of identity. Nevertheless, it's still a very small number of patients. And if you look at this, I'm sorry, it's kind of uh, complex, but this is how the analysis works. The group of patients that had hmm, the lowest likelihood of stent thrombosis was yet again a pixaban and no aspirin. Okay, this is here. And then also a pixaban with aspirin was here down here in red. So stent thrombosis appears to be higher with warfarin or with aspirin containing groups. So if you looked at bleeding and stent thrombosis events, bleeding events were much more common actually than stent thrombosis in the study, right? And that makes sense. Stent thrombosis seems to be very rare with modern drug eluting stents and modern therapies and antiplatelets, right? So if you looked at the actual numbers of <clears throat> uh, bleeding events with placebo, it was lower than aspirin by almost a third and Stem thrombosis events were like 11 in the aspirin arm and 21 in the placebo arm. Very small numbers. But of course, what is clinically much more valuable and much more numerically robust is this major bleeding and ISTH bleeding. So they concluded really in patients with AFib and recent ACS PCI with the current generation of drug eluting stents, definite or probable stem thrombosis is very rare and most occurs frequently in the early phase after PCI within the first 30 days, if you would. This data therefore supports the use of a pixaban and a P2Y12 inhibitor without aspirin during the first six months for most patients, considering that there's a twofold increase in risk with any aspirin use. So basically, you can limit that to the initial phase and delete it. Now, if you have a patient with a high risk of stent thrombosis and an acceptable breathing risk, using aspirin up to 30 days after PCI should be considered. And then other strategies with length, longer or shorter should be looked at as well. Now, then this led to this very nice presentation at ACC um, one year later, looking at, again, analysis from the Augusta study, how long to continue aspirin after ACS and PCI. So we've determined the early phase, how long. And this is the important point. When you looked at this analysis, those events with placebo versus aspirin, there were numerically more of some ischemic events in patients with placebo than aspirin. So there were 11 patients with aspirin who had stem thrombosis, 21 in the placebo arm, myocardial infarction 68, 84 in the placebo arm, and urgent revascularization 37 versus 47. So the analysis of the thrombotic events that it was only early within the first 30 days. Everything else, cardiovascular death, death and stroke were not different. So it seems that there is now a temporal relationship where the balance of bleeding and ischemic risk is important. So you only have not only have to consider what you're giving and the dosing, you also have to consider the timing. Because clearly, stent thrombosis attenuates over time. If you have a PCI here, stent thrombosis is greatest here, and it decreases over time. So you maybe want to protect during this phase, the early phase. Bleeding is essentially constant and cumulative, and is dependent mostly on the potency and the dosing of the antithrombotic agent. So this sub-analysis was really looking at the following. To look at the risk of bleeding and benefit of ischemic events in the first 30 days and from 30 days to six months using the addition of aspirin to the dual antiplatelet and the NOAC, right? So there may be a time benefit that disappears that you don't need to continue forever. So the definitions of bleeding here are very specific and very strict, okay? Um, fatal intracranial bleeding or major bleeding are the most severe types of bleeding that you can imagine, and particularly intracranial bleeding. The ischemic events that are most serious are death, stem thrombosis, MI, and stroke. The um, other definition, which is called the broad definition, is any bleeding requiring hospitalization, any major bleeding that requires, um, or non-major bleeding that requires hospital attention, fatal or intracranial bleeding. This is a very broad definition. This is the strict definition up here. So if you take the ischemic and bleeding outcomes, taking these very big definitions in mind, if you take a very strict definition, severe bleeding was higher with aspirin, but at double that of a placebo. If you took the less strict, the broader definition, any hospital intervention, 
any kind of intervention at all, it goes from 7.5 to 4. It's almost double still. However, with all of the ischemic outcomes, there was a very minimal difference. Even with the most generous definition, there's no difference. With the intermediate or severe, again, it's only a fraction of a difference, like 0.6%. So there seems to be some sort of a balance at 30 days, which you have to look at, okay? So this is sort of a numerical representation, tripling the broad definition, or maybe a half with the severe definition. And in terms of aspirin and placebo with ischemic outcomes, again, not a big difference, very small difference as well. Now, once you go to 30 days to six months, what happens here? The ischemic outcomes are flat. There is no difference. The bleeding outcomes still continue to accumulate with aspirin, right? So the addition of aspirin here is not contributing anything to improving ischemia, but it is increasing the bleeding unnecessarily, which means maybe we can get rid of the aspirin after the initial vulnerable phase. So from randomization to 30 days, the major bleeding, ICH, and fatal bleeding is increased significantly with aspirin, almost triple. And CV death, stroke, stent, and thrombosis, ischemic events, are actually lowered by aspirin. So this is 30 days, right? So if you go a little bit further out, look at what happens. The curves are literally on top of each other, aspirin, placebo. You're doing absolutely nothing. You're not reducing stroke, you're not reducing heart attacks, you're not reducing stem thrombosis, but you are certainly resulting in a doubling of fatal intracranial hemorrhage and major bleeding. So after 30 days, let's get rid of the aspirin. I think that's the message that comes out. So again, this was the conclusion, and this was a remarkable conclusion. We've been taught to use aspirin exclusively and indefinitely in patients with coronary artery disease. Now we've seen from randomized evidence-based medicine that P2Y12 inhibitor, and oral anticoagulation, whether apixaban or warfarin, aspirin acutely and for up to 30 days results in equal increase in severe bleeding and benefit in terms of ischemic stroke. After 30 days, aspirin continues to increase bleeding without reducing ischemic events. Therefore, in a patient-centric shared decision-making model, the ideal duration of aspirin should be limited in the first 30 days, and then you simply have your antiplatelet therapy and your DOAC as a preference over warfarin. Because remember, the other arm with warfarin had more bleeding anyway. So um, this was then followed by this very interesting and very complete meta-analysis that looked at all atrial fibrillation studies with PCI. It's a fascinating uh, um, meta-analysis. And for those of you who don't do statistics a lot, it's basically like drawing this um, quadrangle. So here are all the studies that included warfarin and a P2Y12. So that's Woost, Pioneer, AFPCI, Redual, and Augustus, the warfarin arms. Here are the DOAC studies with combination of the DOAC and uh, P2Y12 and aspirin. And here are the subgroup analyses that included the DOAC and the P2Y12, the um, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor alone. So you have all of it around the circle, and then you look at the different connections between all of them. It's called a network meta-analysis. And then they come out with what is the most favorable outcome in each group. So Timmy defined major bleeding. The lowest bleeding risk of all of these, and this is 12,000 patients in all meta-analyses, is the use of a DOAC and an antiplatelet without, without aspirin, okay? The reference, of course, would be the triple therapy with warfarin. So you know that the warfarin is higher and, uh, and the NOAC with the DAP is a little bit higher. This is actually the lowest number. If you look at the trial-defined bleeding outcomes, so whatever the trial was specifying ISTH major bleeding, clinically relevant non-major bleeding, so whatever bleeding outcomes was, the statistical significance was in favor of using a DOAC and antiplatelet alone, not dual antiplatelet with single antiplatelet, and less than the warfarin, of course, and less than the use of triple therapy. Intracranial hemorrhage. Actually, again, as you see here, DOAC, with a P2Y12, any antiplatelet, without aspirin, without warfarin, significant reduction. Now, this is statistically significant because these other cross the line of identity, very important, almost a 60% reduction of intracranial hemorrhage. And then MACE, whatever the strategy you took, was actually the same. So if you took dual antiplatelet with a DOAC, dual anti single antiplatelet like Plavix with a DOAC, warfarin with a DAP, all the same. No difference really in stem thrombosis and MI, which as we said, was only very, very small increase in the Augusta study. So the network meta-analysis showed us here that 
in patients with AFib undergoing PCI for ACS, a dual <coughs> direct or no novel oral anticoagulant plus an antiplatelet T2Y12 with fluor bleeding complications, less intracranial bleeding without significant difference in ischemic events um, compared to the most powerful regimen of warfarin with dual antiplatelet therapy, a very large difference in bleeding. So looking to the future, what, what are the other possibilities that we can research? So are we gonna have studies that look specifically at stem thrombosis? What are the guidelines? Because the guidelines in Europe and America and Canada and so on have been somewhat confusing and complicated. And the duration of antiplatelet therapy after 12 months, ideally the patient should only be on an oral anticoagulant and not Plavix or P2Y12 inhibitor, right? There are some additional analyses coming out from Augustus, including the different types of P2Y12. So there's obviously a difference between ticagrelor and the risk of bleeding with uh, uh, clopidogrel. We want to look at outcomes between Hasbled and Chadsvask, which is the one that favors the outcome more. Patients who are treatment naive versus patients who have been on an oral anticoagulant. And of course, time and therapeutic range and heart failure. So this is the final outcome of all of this excellent uh, evidence-based medicine. And this is much better than the previous guidelines that were consensus-based. So you take your patient with pre-existing atrial fibrillation. Yes. Look at the default strategy. The default strategy would be in the hospital, triple therapy with a NOAC and dual antiplatelet, including aspirin and P2Y12. Okay. And if they have a high bleeding risk, you will shorten the duration of um, aspirin with clopidogrel or aspirin with prasugrel to basically one month. You want to make it as short as possible if the bleeding risk is high. On the other hand, if the bleeding risk is low, you can extend your antiplatelet therapy with the DOA for as long as 12 months, right? Especially if they have a high ischemic risk. And this is in the far right-hand side. So you look at the high ischemic risk patient you're going to put them on triple therapy for the first month. You can extend the triple therapy longer, but you know that's going to cause extra bleeding. But even with that, if you're using dual antiplatelet therapy for um, the remaining 12 months, then at the end, you'll look at these patients only taking NOAC alone. No need for aspirin in the long term. So this is really how you very nicely balance your bleeding risk and your ischemic risk. And of course, the bleeding risk, we know that we use that chads vest has blood score. With the ischemic risk, you can use any number of the ischemic risk calculators, but it's fairly common sense. The presence of an ACS increases the ischemic risk. If you have multiple stents, you have increased ischemic risk. If you have multiple long stents, you have increased ischemic risk. And if you have repeated vascularization events, you have high ischemic risk. So that's really the balance that you have to consider. And in fact, in patients who have both, which is common. You have elderly patients who have multivessel disease who are also frail and have GI bleeding. Again, this is the kind of patient where you want to minimize the duration of dual therapy to possibly less than six months and give no X alone for the rest of the duration of their treatment. So again, it's an individualized decision. You try to fit the patient as much as you can into which one of the boxes, right? Similarly, in patients who don't have AFib, again, you can limit dual therapy if they have a high, high bleeding risk. Remember, bleeding with dual antiplatelet therapy is not benign either and can lead to fairly severe complications. So here is an example where you have a patient with a very high bleeding risk, is given aspirin and clopidogrel for one month. Of course, they didn't have AFib, so they don't have the DOAC. And therefore, then you give them the extended duration of clopidogrel alone going out to 12 to 14 months. And the more the ischemic risk, the more you're going to use combination, the less the ischemic risk, the more you're going to limit the combination. And with that, I thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to uh, Professor Nadal. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hani, for the outstanding uh, uh, presentation. Uh, uh, this is a quite uh, very difficult uh, topic and uh, to deal with uh, with uh, such a medical uh, situation uh, we will leave the questions uh, uh, toward the end now we will move to the next uh, speaker we have dr uh, hassanin 
Al Shukraji. He is a consultant uh, internal uh, medicine uh, working in the United uh, Arab uh, Emirates. He has a special uh, interest in uh, uh, anti thrombotic uh, uh, therapy. Uh, uh, he worked at Mid Clinic uh, Park uh, View uh, Hospital uh, in Dubai. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hassanin will uh, present to us uh, NOAX in patient uh, with uh, venous uh, thromboembolism. Uh, Dr. Hassanin, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitations for the uh, presentations. Um, and, uh, I'll share the presentations now. Um, so um, uh, I'll speak. Um, uh, I'll discuss today basically the oxygen patient with the VT is a quite a big subject to cover in in, uh, in uh, half an hour. Um, area that I'm going to focus on the next half an hour, giving you a bit of an overview of the. Um, uh, VTE, a um, uh, few slides about the duration of anticoagulations, focusing more on focusing more, more on the risk scoring, um, as well a few slides about the cancer associated thrombosis and cancer screen for the unprovoked um, uh, PE. About these, um, uh, one of common questions I get, I get normally ask ask about and discuss with the, with the, with colleagues. Um, uh, VTE venous thromboembolism is very is very common. It's one of the leading causes of um, death um, uh, worldwide. Um, it's estimated to cause at least three million deaths um, uh, worldwide, by more than five hundred deaths in, in Europe every year, and estimated to have three hundred deaths in in in, in USA. This is um, um, a lot of it is, is discovered during um, uh, postpartum, a lot of, and a lot of this gamma even and and uh, and diagnosed. Um, so it's a common it's a common um, uh, disease can affect one to two um, uh, uh, per one thousand adults worldwide. Um, um, over seventies, this goes up to two to seven, um, um, and over eighties goes to between three to twelve um, out of a thousand uh, people. Not only does it have um, um, high mortality, not only it's common, but as well, um, it's one of the leading causes of uh, disability adjusted um, um, life years lost. Um, it's actually in a few years um, ago, it was the main leading cause in, um, in um, um, disability adjusted life years in low to middle income and um, was a second common cause in a high, high income country. Um, common, um, significant, high risk, plus as well high risk of, uh, of, of complications if um, poorly treated. A uh, patient with um, um, pulmonary embolism can develop the CTF, um, and as well patient with DV, um, DVT can develop post-thrombotic um, uh, syndrome. Um, this is um, a graph from a study a few years ago, just highlighting that um, uh, VTE goes up with um, uh, with age. Um, and as you can see, um, we have aging populations, so more and more we will see in uh, uh, VTE. Um, uh, this, um, this graph from two, from two studies basically showing the changing um, use of anticoagulations. Predominantly for them, before 20, 20, 20 years or so, the predominant anticoagulation was um, warfarin and, um, and uh, low molecular weight heparins with the start of using um, um, DOAX or NOAX. We can start basically one, seeing um, increasing trend in using DOAX, two, increasing overall use of, um, of, uh, of anticoagulations. In fact, as you can see, as you can see here, it's almost 50% um, from um, um, the use of anticoagulation between 2014 and 2017. Suspect this is a larger registry. This is most likely is actually going uh, going even more up in the in the, um, in the current years. Um, why it's gone up? There are many many reasons. Obviously, there's a lot of benefits from the from using the wax. Um, comparing, for example, to warfarin, it's um, fewer drug to drug interactions, lower bleeding bleeding rates, fixed dosing, doesn't require blood testing, very convenient for the for the for the patients. Um, surgical management post op as well, much more easier than 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 warfarin, um, uh, and overall is uh, non inferior to the warfarin. All the wax are non inferior to the warfarin and have few, fewer fewer bleeding bleeding bleeding. English. And uh, hopefully you've, you've all come across these, um, these, these slides. There's uh, plenty of studies now for the, for the DOACs from the M Amplify for Apixipam, Einstein for um, Reproxipam, uh, Hokusai for, da, for, the, for, the, for the Edoxipam and um, Arika for, for, um, for the Bigatron. All, all of them in a way, um, um, main aims showing non-inferiority to, um, 
to um, um, gold standard, which is intended to be the uh, uh, warfare. Um, uh, all, all, all of them have shown um, um, favors that uh, they do ask comparison to them uh, to the to the warfare in terms of recurrence of the of the of the VT of the v, v, uh, PT, PT, um, as well lower bleeding risk comparison basically to um, to warfare. Um, uh, however, anticoagulation, they are not um, medications free from, 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 from side effects. Um, uh, this is um, uh, from a study a few years ago in, um, in um, uh, USA. Um, this is a um, medication-related adverse event admissions to the uh, ER departments. Uh, and you can see warfarin has been the number one reason for medication-related side effect presentation to the to the to the to the ER. In fact, if the age for the age uh, above 65 is almost 30 uh, percent um, of the presentations related to medication side effects is um, uh, related to the warfarin. On the other side as well, you can see um, uh, rovroxibam, um, dabigatrons, and anti antiplatelets in, uh, in between. So these are the medications not to be taken lightly. They do have um, um, side effects, and a lot of them they can present um, uh, to um, to ER with the medication-related adverse events. So they come to the ER in the same study. What do they come with? They come mostly with the, with the bleeding, and the most common is basically is the GI bleeding, 27, 27%. Um, big uh, proportion as well, 19% uh, lab abnormality. This assumes basically related to um, uh, INR, high, high, uh, high, high INR. And this is just to highlight them um, that um, as, as above, they are not medications. They are high risk medications um, um, uh, as highlighted uh, before. Um, the guidelines for treatment of uh, VTEs evolved massively initially for them. Up to 2012, we didn't have much much op much options. Then significantly changed with the introduction of um, of, um, uh, of, um, of 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 the max. Um, uh, this is um, another European Society um, uh, of Cardiology guideline 2019. It classified the uh, VTE into low, intermediate, and and, and high risk. Um, low classified or, or decided to be less than 30%, intermediate is between 3 to 8% per year, while the high is more than 8%, an example from each, each, um, um, each, each category. Another way of, um, of classifying it is using them, oh, in a way it's been, been used for many, many years, and that's my preferred way of, 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 um, of categorizations and uh, patients with the VTEs to classify it, whether it is a provoked and, uh, and and provoked um, for the provoked um, uh, to be more specific, whether it is a transit provoking factor, um, uh, whether it is a persistent factor, and whether it is a major um, provoking factor or minor minor provoking provoking factor. Um, why it's important to classify purely because it has a huge impact on the risk of uh, risk of recurrence. Um, so this is a bit old study, two thousand two thousand three um, uh, patients who had. Um, uh, a clot secondary to um, provoked by, uh, let's say, major surgery. They've been followed up for two years. Almost none had any uh, any recurrence of the of the VT in the study in the study, which was in interesting. Um, while the patients who had um, non surgical um, uh, non surgical trigger, they have almost um, uh, five percent um, um, risk of um, VT recurrence in, in two years. Um, while the, the others, um, the unprovoked, is, is goes up um, almost 10% uh, uh, a year. Uh, so why that's why it's uh, hence the reason why it's very essential and important to try and um, classify and decide whether this is a provoked or unprovoked, and if it is a provoked, is it a minor provoking factor or major provoking factor, and is it transit or um, persistent um, persistent um, and the say goes. That's another another um, um, uh, study showing uh, the unprovoked, um, predominantly the unprovoked pl uh, plot risk of of, um, of recurrence. Um, it's worth highlighting this is a cumulative risk. So basically, every year patients will have will have uh, will have risk. It tend to be for the first year for the unprovoked clot, they have around 10% um, risk of uh, VT, VT recurrence. By five years, they have around 30%. Um, uh, this goes up by around 5% every, every year, basically up to 30% up to, uh, in five years. Um, by 10 years, they have around 40% 40, 40 risk of um, uh, VT recurrence. Just to highlight, this is predominantly for the unprovoked um, uh, venous thromboembolism. Um, so based on that, what's the duration? What the guidelines su suggest the duration of anticoagulation if, if you have a patient diagnosed with a um, VTE? Uh, three months, the current guidelines, minimum, minimum basically for all, um, for, uh, all, all patients. If they have a major transient, transient reversible risk factors, then three months sh sh 
should know it be, be sufficient. If you have a persistent risk, or if you have a minor minor risk or unprovoked, then as well, again, minimum three months. Um, but these patients should have a, um, a reassessment before stopping anticoagulation to decide whether they are suitable for extended duration of anticoagulations. Um, this is based on um, uh, three, um, you decide based on, on, on three aspects with the patient's preference, bleeding risk, risk of recurrence. And I'll come to address these, these three during during my talk. Um, you know, why, why, why the durations has been set as three months? We previously know we've used it three months, we have six months, is it six months better? Is it three months, three months better? Now, the VTE recurrence for three months or, v, or six months, more or less the same. This has been just demonstrated in, in multiple studies. As, as you can see in the graphs, if you're given three months or if you're given six months, they will catch up and they will have both um, similar risk of recurrence. Same applying this in, in this in this study. So the risk, the risk of recurrence, whether you give three months or six months, um, is, is the same after you stop the anticoagulations, catch up basically with the, with the same. Obviously, occasionally for clinical reasons, you might give it six months, not six, not three months. For example, if a patient is having the line cancer, the minimum is six months, predominant, but preferably to be long, 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 long term. And if there's a patient's active, active cancer. Uh, for patients with a massive provoked clot, you might want to give an extended course to six to six months to make sure the resolution of the of the clot. Same apply if I have high proximal DVT. If you decide, okay, they might need it for for resolution of the of the clot. But the three VS six months does not impact on the on the risk of their VTE recurrence, as as evidenced by these studies. So if we go again, again um, so if we see a patients with unprovoked clot or minor provoking fa factor, what are the um, um, helpful tools that, that we have to be able to uh, to measure or to decide if they um, need an extended anticoagulations? Three three aspects. You basically um, number one is um, the risk of recurrence without anticoagulations. On the other side is uh, bleeding while um, patients receiving anticoagulation. So there is uh, their bleeding risk. And the third thing is patient 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 preference. Um, um, in, in my practice, uh, patient preference play a significant role. I've seen a lot of patients where they have a massive clot, for example, where they tick a lot lot of boxes for high risk of recurrence. But they are adamant to only have a limited duration of anticoagulation after their first first uh, uh, event, and they don't want to be on long term anti anticoagulations. And I've seen cases on the other way around where they have a very small risk of um, PT VT recurrence based on the uh, scoring we basically basically use or based on other other factors. But they are very concerned of having any further clots, and they they prefer to be on anticoagulations uh, longer long, long term. So the patient patient preference play, plays a big role to decide about if you're offering an extended anticoag uh, anticoagulation for patients after first um, first uh, first clot. Um, so what are the factors that predict risk of recurrence? And what do we, what do we have? There are um, several um, uh, risk scores that has been has been validated and used to try and identify patients who are at high risk of um, of VT, VT, VT recurrence. And I'll come across Couple, couple, couple of these um, um, mode of presentations, location of the clot, uh, residual venous obstructions, uh, gender, age, risk, or D dimer levels. All of these uh, um, uh, give us um, uh, some um, some inf informations and give us a, an idea of on, on the possibilities risk of um, VT, VT, VT recurrence. Um, so the prolonged prolonged uh, study they use the D dimer to risk stratify patient of high risk or, or low risk. And there had, has been a couple of more studies um, using D-dimer as a tool to see whether the patients have a higher risk of VT recurrence or not. And, and most of them, they are showing if you have a positive D-dimer either before you stop or after you stop at, at anticoagulations, um, uh, then the risk of VT recurrence goes, goes up massively. This is for the group of D-dimer negative, the risk of recurrence, and this is for the group of D-dimer positive, the risk, risk, risk of um, VT, VT recurrence. Male have a higher risk of VT VT recurrence, and so that's another. That's why it's been contributed in in, in a few of the um, risk risk scoring. Um, again, um, the proximal DVT or proximal clots have a higher risk of VT of um, uh, VT recurrence as well. Um, so the risk scores are uh, available. Dash and Hardy and Vienna score based on the um, uh, uh, on, for example, the DASH score from the D dimer, age less than 50, and male and hormone use. Um, um, these are the, the details of the of the of the scores. Give us an idea if they have a higher risk of of, of, 
of, of VTE. So these are the three commoners that are um, in mostly are, are intent to use. And most of the people who assess VT they intend to use as a helpful tool. However, bear in mind these studies all um, uh, done at the time of uh, mostly at time of. Um, and warfarin and anticoagulation as a as a uh, as a warfarin and um, these only uh, helpful they are not the end um, so if patients have a uh, high dash score there might be some other factors like a bleeding 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 risk of patient preference that might dissuade you from uh, offering patients um, uh, anticoagulation long term after um, after the first uh, first first event uh, what about um, a bleeding risk? So uh, again, bleeding risk. There's multiple um, uh, uh, bleeding score that has been has been uh, validated. The most common is uh, um, has bleeds from the um, uh, warfarin, and there is a specific one for the VT VT bleed, bleed to try and identify the patient's high risk of um, uh, of bleeding. And so again, that's just to highlight the decisions to decide whether the, whether this patient is suitable for um, for extended duration of anticoagulations will be based on the risk of recurrence, bleeding risk, and the patient patient preference. Um, now, if you decide that the patients have a high risk of um, uh, of recurrence and you want to give them anticoagulations, what medications are uh, 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 available? Um, uh, studies as well again has been used um, uh, Dawax, like uh, uh, Apixipam, Raproxivam, and Dabigatran. Uh, All of them have shown uh, favors Dawax in terms of um, in terms of um, uh, recurrence of the of the of the VTE. In terms of um, uh, major major bleeding, um, uh, with the exceptions of um, uh, Apixipams, others showed a bit of um, um, higher risk of VTE comparison to the to the uh, to the, the Apixipam. The Epixipam at a smaller dose, which is the Amplify extension, what they've used is uh, 2.5 milligram twice daily. So almost um, almost um, uh, uh, similar risk to using, to using aspirin. So it's um, um, relatively, in a way, smaller dose, 2.5 milligrams twice a day, numbers um, that might cause harms. Almost you have to give more than 200 to cause one. One, uh, one harm, so it's in a way similar to, uh, almost similar to uh, the use of, uh, of aspirin. Um, that's the ACCP and, and guidelines about the duration of anticoagulation. So ba basically, if it is isolated distals, they tend to be three months because the risk of recurrence of VTE from a distal clot is, is tend to be small. Um, if it is a reversible provoking factor like major surgery, again, so three months, um, indifferent for the, for the cancer, for the unprovoked, Depend on the bleeding risk and then D dimer testing, for for, uh, for example, to try and, and, and quantify as well, depending on the patient's um, patient's uh, uh, preference. Um, ESC guidelines the similar, basically, if extended anticoagulation is decided, then the patients can be given either reduced dose of abixiban, 2.5 milligram BT or or or, or, or reproxiban. Um, uh, uh, again, that's basically just highlighting them. ESC guidelines and using anticoagulations and uh, duration. Just to highlight one thing here on this is um, antiphospholipid um, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Morphine is the is the, um, uh, the is the main main basically treatment that's based on a lot of uh, some some studies which um, um, uh, has shown Dawax, especially in the uh, Rivaroxaban, has showed uh, inferiority to um, uh, to warfarin, and patients develop um, more um, uh, VTE arterial and venous thrombosis and antiphospholipid. This is for triple positive antibodies, um, um, uh, positive hence warfarin is the uh, drug of choice. Uh, what about cancer? So um, uh, VT is a common complications with cancer. Around 15% uh, of patients with cancer will, will have uh, VT, um, and then more than 20% the incidence of recurrence of VT in, in, within one year of patients with cancer. Um, this is just a slide giving you an overview of the reasons why patients with cancer develop, develop PE. It could be patients related, could be treatment related, and, and, and biomarkers and tumor, tumor related. Um, uh, not only that, the risk of um, VTE for patients with cancers uh, varies with their stage and varies with uh, what happens to them. As you can see here, the stage goes up with the period of hospitalization, chemotherapy, if they have remissions, this goes down, then it goes up when there's metastases to the end of life. Almost all of them, they will have a higher risk than, than general, general uh, uh, population. Not only it's it's uh, it's common, but as well, uh, thrombolism is one of the leading causes of death in in, in patients with uh, with cancer, um, um, uh, second to cancer uh, cancer uh, uh, progression. 
Um, so what treatment available for patients with, with cancer? We know it's been for years and years. Options we have is um, predominantly we offer patients with cancer who developed a VTE low molecular weight heparin, therapeutic low molecular weight heparin. This is based on the, the clot uh, clot studies where um, um, uh, where um, sorry um, where has shown um, um, that um, the low molecular weight heparin is um, um, superior or the warfarin is inferior to them. Uh, to low molecular weight happens with the um, recurrence of, um, uh, of of BT. Hence, low molecular weight happen was the main main um, um, let's say treatments. Um, however, a lot of studies and um, psychological studies all have shown that the patients who developed um, uh, P or DVTs who cast cancer, we give them long course of six months or longer of low molecular weight happens. Um, then become very anxious about the recurrence of VTE plus the inconvenience of using the psychological impact of using the, the injections on a, on a daily basis. Finally, we um, have a, a, a bill that's been basically used for, um, for um, uh, VTE in cancer patients. Um, predominantly, doxipam, rivaroxipam, and epixipam both has been studied in, in the cat and the cancer-associated uh, uh, thrombosis. I mean, uh, apologies, it's a very busy, busy slide, but the main main issue they are uh, all inferior to the use of um, of um, uh, of um, low molecular weight heparin. So obviously, the gold standard is low molecular weight um, heparin. They are non non inferior to uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin. However, there is an increased risk of um, um, bleeding, predominantly in the hocosi and then and then eduxifam and the uh, uh, So the bleeding risk is higher. Except for the uh, Calabagio, the Epixipam, um, the Islam low molecular weight heparin showed none, none inferiority for both for the recurrence of the VT plus as well. It's not doesn't give any higher higher risk of bleeding. This is for all types of cancer, including GI uh, GI cancer. Uh, the ASH guidelines for management of VT VT, the most most recent one, has recommended basically using um, uh, Dawax as an um, anticoagulation for patients who developed um, uh, VT in a cancer patients. So using either apixipam or, or aproxipam. Um, initial treatment, they suggest you can consider, for example, as well, low molecular weight happen if any concerns about interactions or anything like that. Um, after that, and long term, then they suggest basically using uh, uh, DAWAX over low, over low molecular weight happen. Um, especially now with apixipam um, having lower risk of, um, uh, or similar risk of bleeding in comparison to, um, uh, to low molecular weight happen. Um, what about one or two slides about um, uh, uh, unprovoked um, uh, VTE and um, uh, and cancer? We know that uh, patients around ten percent um, of patients who um, got diagnosed with unprovoked um, uh, VTE would be diagnosed with cancer within one or one, one or two years. So a few years ago, um, that's put um, obviously pressure on, uh, to investigate any patients with them with them with an um, uh, unprovoked clot with extensive investigations like CT scans and MRIs, imaging, so on, all of, all of those. However, um, more, more recent studies, like the, um, um, uh, some investigators, there's uh, as well um, several, um, let's say Cochrane rev uh, review, all of it suggests that um, um, uh, extensive um, uh, investigations normally not um, not not required. They did not show any improvement in mortality, neither improvement in the pickup rate of the of the of the of the cancer. Hence, most of, most of the societies now recommend against um, uh, extensive um, um, uh, investigation. However, however, for any patients with unprovoked clot, a very thorough history, uh, thorough examinations. Basic investigations like chest X-ray, obviously blood, calcium, urine analysis, and uh, and um, just to emphasize, and as um, they have, they should have a um, uh, screening um, for cancer as per um, uh, as per um, uh, age. So, for example, PSA, uh, mammogram, uh, swabs, if it's due, if it's due, whatever is basically due as per as per as per age. So, it's cancer screening as per as per age. Rather than rather than extensive scans without any um, without any evidence that they they, they would change the uh, outcome. Um, um, hopefully, I've given you a quick uh, overview of the VTE. The duration of anticoagulations, as we discussed, is predominantly three three months. Um, uh, minimum for for uh, unprovoked three months and reassess the need of extended anticoagulations. Um, risk scoring and um, um, and the tools used to uh, identify patients at higher higher risk. I've touched a bit about cancer associated thrombosis and the um, 
uh, available here now of, of DOACs, especially apixipam as an option of, uh, of treatment, um, cancer screening of unprovoked uh, uh, VT. Um, and that's conclude my uh, presentation. Many thanks. Thank you for uh, for uh, for listening. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Doctor uh, uh, Hassanin, for the elegant uh, presentation. And now we open the floor for uh, uh, questions. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, questions, uh, Doctor Hassanin. Do you Anticoagulate uh, DVT uh, patient on dialysis. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, ac ac excellent question. So basically, the choice of anticoagulation for patients who are who are um, uh, uh, hemodialyzed. Um, studies few from America, mainly from USA. We use um, uh, um, Epixipam, two point five milligrams twice daily, reduced reduced dose. Um, uh, Mostly, obviously, traditionally, we use all warfarin. Uh, so warfarin would be the, basically the, the medication to go with. However, in a few cases, I've used it, um, uh, epixipam, reduced, reduced dose for patients on, on, on dialysis. Uh, that's based on um, experience and some observations, studies used in, in, in the US. Uh, another uh, question, uh, the uh, role of uh, implantable uh, IVC uh, filter. So uh, IVC, IVC, IVC filter have very limited limited um, roles. Basic, basically, it's been used, for example, for patients who um, uh, no um, contraindication to use of um, uh, anticoagulation as a bridge. So, for example, patients who um, are a DVT or plan for procedures or uh, bleeding. Um, so, um, it's only a temporary temporary measure. Um, uh, again, used for example of if, um, uh, if, if, um, if a patient actively bled as a result of um, anticoag anticoagulations. Bear in mind the IVC filter. They need to be for temporary time. They need to be um, taken out at some at at, at some points. So it's only a measures that give you a bit of uh, time to stop bleeding the patients is a, is a, is a, is a bleeding that for any reason that you cannot give them therapeutic um, anticoagulations. Uh, doc, I have a question for uh, Dr. Hani. Uh, yes. uh, why uh, edoxiban is not recommended for patients with uh, high creatinine clearance? So this is actually a false statement. It's not correct. In the US package insert, it states that if your creatinine clearance is over 100. This is not now present in the European insert or any of the Gulf label. And I'm going to show you why. Because when the FDA actually mandated this, they weren't really um, aware of the data from previous studies. So I'm going to show So I know this is going to come up. So I'm going to show you the slide that I prepared for that. So. Um, <clears throat> When you look at how you calculate GFR, right? You calculate GFR based on creatinine clearance and weight. The only way you can make your GFR higher than normal if in the denominator, your weight is bigger, right? So in the obese patient, there's a falsely elevated GFR. It's not like you grow a third kidney or something ridiculous like that, right? So um, this is actually what was presented to them. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna share this specific slide to highlight this. Um, the FDA required a sort of uh, an analysis of this function. And if you see here very clearly, uh, when you look at the rocket AFib study in patients with a GFR above 80, again, there is an increased risk of uh, NOAC versus warfarin. In the Aristotle study, when the patient's GFR is above 80, remember this is a calculation, it's not a real number. The hazard ratio was worse with NOAC than warfarin. And the same thing applies with edoxaban. So in fact, all three of these um, studies showed a worsening of the outcome with warfarin being better because of an artificially high GFR. So there's no such thing as don't prescribe edoxaban in patients with high GFR. It's actually been removed from the European and the UAE label. It's not a true thing. It's just a calculation, right? So it's, it's just a false number. It doesn't really exist. 
thank you for uh, the explanation. Uh, uh, there is another uh, question for how long you recommend dual uh, antiplatelets for patients with high risk of uh, bleeding. Sure. Uh, it, so uh, triple, uh, you did mention, uh, yeah, this is uh, yeah one month, and then uh, it could go up to twelve months. Sure. So it's an excellent point, and I think this is the this is not the ESC guideline. This is the European Heart Rhythm Association guideline. It's a practical guide. I think we should keep it in our clinics because, as you mentioned, this is a very complex topic and it's undergone a lot of modification here. So. In green are factors to shorten or reduce combination therapy. So if you have a high bleeding risk that you can, cannot correct, so somebody with arterial venous malformations in the abdomen or recurrent GI bleeding or somebody who's had an intracranial bleed, you can't really fix that. So if that's the case, then you're going to compress your uh, dual or triple therapy to as short as possible. And if you see here from this specific practical guideline, essentially in an ACS patient, the recommendation is with a PCI, with ticagrelor and aspirin, basically just about a week, and then get rid of the aspirin. And then go to dual therapy with NOAC and ticagrelor. And then after six months, you can go to switch to clopidogrel because it has a lower um, intensity. And then after one year, uh, monotherapy. Now, the other side of the coin is, let's say you're concerned about high ischemic risk, right? Multivessel PCI, whatever. So all of the things here listed underneath, high atherothrombotic risk. So using like a syntax score, if you would, stenting of the left main, proximal LED, bifurcation, recurrent MI, stent thrombosis with a low bleeding risk allows you to extend the dual therapy longer. So this now has to be a very individualized treatment decision. And I think having this particular slide on the desk or on the computer, or even a snapshot, screenshot in your in your phone, to refer to when you have these patients. The elective PCI is a little bit more clear, right? Because basically they're telling us you have the triple therapy for about one week, seven days, then just go to dual therapy. Particularly beneficial is the clopidogrel NOAC combination for six months, and then stop everything and just stay on NOAC monotherapy, right? So that's the easy one. This one has three branches and there's a lot of variations. So it's also very helpful to use that. The syntax score, I think is very helpful because if it's in the elective patients and the GRACE score, um, if it's an ACS, again, tells you the atherothrombotic risk. If it's low, you can afford to use shorter therapy. If it's high and you have a lot of these additional factors, you can use longer therapy. Obviously, I'm talking about the antiplatelet, not the NOAC. The NOAC, as you see, will continue throughout. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a, a scenario for... Uh... Uh, Dr. Hani, uh, 75 year old male, uh, a case of chronic atrial fibrillation, uh, mm -hmm. had non uh, ST elevation MI, and subsequently he was cath and they stented his LAD. Uh, 15 days later, he, uh, he was placed on triple therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, 15 days later, he fell and sustained subarachnoid hemorrhage. So, okay. uh, how you uh, uh, how you will manage this kind of uh, 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 patient? So this is now a completely different story. This is how to manage AFib patients with an intracranial hemorrhage, right? Mm -hmm. And the data uh, here it, is very complex, it, right? Yeah, ACS. He, uh, yeah. So he has. It, so essentially, now after the ACS and the triple antiplatelet therapy, now we have another problem, which is the intracranial hemorrhage complication. So this is the subject of a lot of controversy, as even more, even less data and even less evidence. But I'm actually going to try and summarize this uh, very, very succinctly. Once you have an intracranial hemorrhage, you can't literally give them anything. You literally cannot give anything. You know, aspirin, Plavix, anticoagulation. But there are some strategies that allow you, based on a very clear discussion with the neurologist, right? and a very detailed assessment of the MRI and the burden of clot and the, sorry, the burden of bleeding. So the intracranial hemorrhage literature is very specific about what is a very high risk for recurrent bleeding. And that is if you have on the MRI more than 30 square MLs of bleeding, 
and what they call superficial hemosiderosis. This is something that the uh, neurologists have defined um, as a very high risk of rebleeding. So once that's defined, ultimately you're basically, all the guidelines are telling you, you really can't do much in this patient for at least conventionally four weeks of nothing, right? Which means that the risk of thrombosis is tremendously high and their risk of bleeding is also high as well. So there's a recent study called the timing study. This is a fascinating study where they actually looked at patients with moderate, to, uh, mild to moderate strokes. It was just published in, uh, in ACC um, uh, several months ago that they looked at about 800 patients from Sweden with moderate or mild strokes with minimal hemorrhagic transformation, okay? And they either initiated randomized clinical study, initiated antiplatelet versus DOAC within the first 14 days, and they looked at what happened. So initiating some antithrombotic therapy or antiplatelet therapy reduced the risk of recurrent stroke and bleeding by about 40% by month one, two, and three, right? So it is certainly possible to do that. It's not universally not allowed, but I think it's gonna be a very, very individual decision-making in that particular patient. Now, it's also gonna make a difference in this patient whether it's a subdural hematoma or an intraparenchymal hematoma, right? This is a very different kind of story because the subdural hematoma is usually due to superficial uh, dural venous um, uh, bleeding, which can be surgically corrected. So. You know, I think this is the most difficult patient to manage from any standpoint because you're totally stuck for a period of time. And this is the kind of patient I think a left atrial appendage closure would be very reasonable, right? You get your left atrial appendage closure, and then basically you're going to be using antiplatelet therapy only without a DOI. So I think in these difficult scenarios, individual decisions, there's not a whole lot of evidence that you can use to help you. Uh... Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Hani, for uh, uh, um, for your excellent uh, presentation, as well as uh, the uh, answering this, uh, uh, you know, difficult uh, uh, situation Monthly. which uh, we do encounter, uh, uh, especially uh, you know, using uh, a triple therapy. It is, uh, uh, you know, it. It takes a lot of, uh, you know, a, a clinical uh, judgment, and uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, regarding the duration and all that. It's all uh, based on uh, on patients. So each patient is uh, is different and needs to be uh, studied uh, uh, carefully. Uh, I would like to thank both uh, speakers. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank the organizers, uh, Pfizer, by uh, hosting the, this event. Uh, uh, thank you very much and uh, 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 good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.